Um, today, we're, we're uh, honored to have two uh, experts in banking, banking and politics, banking history and politics. Speaking first will be Richard Silla, the Henry Kaufman Professor of History and Financial Institutions and Markets at New York University, Stern School of Business. Dick, Dick's research, which is uh, extensive, is focused on the history of money, banking, and finance. He's the author of many well-known books, including A History of Interest Rates. His writings appear in numerous scholarly journals. He served as the president of the Economic History Association and the Business History Conference, and he's currently chairman of the Museum of American Finance in New York City. Dick? Okay. Thanks, Paul. Uh, let's see. If there's supposed to be a... Oh, there we are. Uh, ah, they changed the date for me. I, this, this was supposed to take place about a month ago, but there was a snowstorm in Washington, and none of us could get here. Uh, <laughs> so it, my, my copy of this is February 20th. But <laughs> um, Okay, so I, you know, we're, we're talking about a book here, and uh, uh, I wanted to say some things about the book that uh, what's missing, you know, what, what might have been in the book and it's not there. And uh, so I wanted to, in the short time available to me, to talk a little bit about that. And also, uh, uh, well, I, one of the things that's missing is a lot of numbers. You know, I'm an economist, Mark's a historian. By the way, we're very good friends for a couple of decades. So uh, uh, economists and historians can get along all right, right? Uh, so uh, economists like data, and you won't find a lot of data in the book. Uh, uh, there's a huge change in American banking. That's what the book is about. It's taken place over five or six decades. But the, you know, Mark talks about the political economy of it, but you don't really see many data on it. The other thing I think is missing is this is you know, a problem that I think a lot of American historians have, is that they, they just look at the United States. And so I think it's the international dimension of uh, changes in banking that is, you, you won't learn a lot about that in Mark's book. Uh, and so those are the two things I wanted to talk about today in the time available to me. Um, here is a, some data on uh, uh, just the number of banks and the total assets of banks in the United States from uh, um, uh, roughly 100 years ago, actually 98 years, 2019 now, and I, the peak number of banks was in 1921, 98 years ago. You know, uh, I've studied 200 years of American banking history, and from uh, three banks in 1790, <laughs> all of which had been created in the previous decade, one in New York, the Bank of New York, one in Boston called the Massachusetts Bank, and one in Philadelphia called the Bank of North America. There were three in 1790. And uh, by 1921, we had, in this country, 30,000 plus banks, 30,000 plus banks. It must have been like banking was like a Starbucks, you know, you were never very far from a bank. You know? uh, today, you're not very far from a Starbucks, usually. Uh, and of course, the assets were in billions, and uh, you know, there's been a lot of inflation since then. Uh, so I won't, the assets won't mean very much, but... Uh, uh, and then you see, you know, in the 1920s, the so-called Roaring Twenties, uh, actually reduced that number quite a bit, you know, from 30,000 to 25,000. And I think, but nobody really thought, you know, that's a lot of banks to lose. I mean, that 5,000 banks is about what we have now, and that's how many we lost in the 1920s. Uh, what happened in that decade is a lot of these little uh, banks, and especially out in the agricultural areas of the country, they were little tiny banks, and they, despite the prosperity of uh, the 20s, uh, it wasn't so prosperous for farmers, and a lot of these banks had lent money to farmers, and the farmers didn't pay them back, so the banks disappeared. So that was a change, a drop in the number of banks. Uh, and so it's not the first time, I mean, but the drop in the number of banks that's happened in the, the period roughly the last six or seven decades that Mark talks about, that was nothing new in American history. It happened before. Then an interesting thing happened. If you look, the, uh, the, the Depression, of course, you know, we lost not 5,000, but you know, cl closer to 10,000, or 9,000, I guess we would say, in, in the 1929-1933 period. Uh, and a lot of us are familiar with that, so we don't have to talk about what happened in, in the, the 1929 to 33. But then an interesting thing, from 1933 to 1980, there was hardly any change in the number of banks. And um, that was a very heavily regulated system. Part of the New Deal financial reforms kept banking uh, 
pretty much, you know, pretty much uh, the same. And, you know, the, the, and that's a pretty long period, and almost nearly half a century of uh, hardly any change in the number of banks. That's, that's when banking, and Alex and I would tell you, uh, Alex wrote about this recently, banking was cartelized. Basically, it was a, a New Deal cartel. You know, the, the shocking number of bank failures led people in 1933 to say, we don't ever want banks to fail again. Well, how can we keep banks from failing again? Uh, well, let's just, you know, not have very many banks and not much banking competition. Uh, interest rate were regulated, uh, entry into banking was regulated, and it was basically to keep the banking safe. And so that was, you know, that was much of my life was, early part of my life was spent in that period. And there wasn't, when I began to study banking history, it was kind of interesting that the number of banks hadn't changed for 30 or 40 years. Uh, and when I probed into it, I discovered that entry was controlled and the idea was not to let banks fail, to keep them very safe. 363 banking, People in the crowd have heard of that, haven't they? I mean, banking was so safe and uh, overly regulated then that you said a banker had, you know, he practiced 363 banking. You borrowed at 3%, you lent the money at 6%, and you were out on the golf course at 3 p.m. to have your round of golf. That's called 363 banking. That's what we had for 47 years. And then, of course, the, the big drop in banking uh, from, uh, since 1980. 1980 wasn't so different from 1933, but now we have uh, you know, a, a big drop to 4,800 banks, or if you count the savings and loans, uh, you get a, a little over 5,000. So that's what Mark's book is about, but you won't find numbers like that in Mark's book. Uh, he's basically explaining how we got supermarket. And the next slide is on concentration, the concentration uh, which worries some people. Uh, uh, Paul said I was the Henry Kaufman professor. I'm actually emeritus now. You, know, you mentioned that I'm emeritus, out to pasture, so to speak. Uh, the Henry Kaufman worries a lot. Uh, Henry's a good friend of mine, and he worries a lot about the concentration in American banking. And so you see the numbers here in 2018, nine banks the ones that have assets greater than $250 billion, uh, had total assets of $8.8 .8 trillion. And then the next 115 largest banks have assets of 10 to $250 billion. They have $5.4 trillion. Uh, so they have, if you look at the total assets uh, on the previous slide, which I, you, uh, I'll tell you, I won't go backwards. Uh, they were, uh, the total assets were $16.5 trillion. And you see that these uh, uh, nine and 124 large banks have the lion's share of those assets. So we live in a very concentrated banking system compared to what we once were. Uh, and the last uh, bullet point there, the FDIC, which rides herd on these, uh, talks about 5,000 community banks, uh, and they include commercial banks and savings institutions. They have 2.2 trillion. The, all of them together are smaller than J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, all of the 5,000 community banks. And they have one-eighth of the assets of the uh, banking system. So we have, we have a very concentrated banking system now. Uh, and, but you won't see a lot of those numbers in Mark's book because he's dealing with the politics of uh, banking more than the uh, structural data of it. Uh, my uh, last slide is uh, that about financial globalization. There's, there's not a lot in the book about financial globalization. I think it, it probably was fairly important in, in what happened. Um, as the points say, the you know, U.S. banks uh, expanded overseas a lot at the beginning of Mark's period, in the 1960s and 1970s. They, they expanded overseas, commercial banks, and then the investment banks followed them. Uh, and when they went overseas, they discovered that banks in other countries had a different banking model. In particular, when they went into the continent of Europe, they discovered a universal banking model. You know, Deutsche Bank, uh, sometimes in the headlines today, was considered a sort of model bank in those days. And, and Deutsche Bank could do all kinds of things American banks couldn't do. They, they could sell you insurance. They could manage your stock portfolio for you. They could, you know, they, they were universal banking, what Mark calls supermarket banks. The universal banking model of Europe was one where banks had a lot of freedom to do the things that American banks were gained. In, in, and Mark tells that story very well. American banks got the freedom, let's say, to be like Deutsche Bank. 
And when they were competing with Deutsche Bank in Europe, they might, might have gotten that idea that maybe we could relax our banking rules a, a little bit more in, in America. Uh, another uh, point about that is called financial department stores. That was popular. And I remember when I first went to Stern in 1990, we had a lot of programs about, you know, should the United States have universal banking? Uh, and my colleagues would, you know, analyze that and come up with the notion that they should. You know, now I think maybe Sandy Weil was financing some of their research. Um, uh, so they began to lobby for, and eventually they received similar banking uh, privileges and regulatory relaxations at home. So, uh, and you know, there was always an argument. I mean, you know, I, I don't think there's anything terribly sinister. Mark doesn't make it seem sinister about the concentration that's happened. I think my friend Henry Kaufman would think it was much more sinister than, than you do, but you tell us how it happened. Uh, but there was an argument for what happened, and that's that American banks, were, because of our banking history, uh, were, you know, they couldn't do things that uh, was go were other countries where you knew you could bank nationwide. In America, really, until then, I was surprised when I started studying banking history that in the 1960s, you had to bank within one state. If you were lucky, you could bank within a state. Like in North Carolina and California, you could have statewide branch banking. But in many states, you had, were restricted to maybe the city you were located in or the city in the surrounding area. That was true of New York City. You could bank a bank in New York City. They were the biggest banks in the country, typically. Some of them were. They could eat, only bank in New York City or maybe the surrounding counties. And then in my home state of Illinois, they were really enlightened. A bank had to operate out of only one office. So some of the big banks, First National Bank of Chicago, for example, had to operate out of one office in Chicago. We called this unit banking. And what, what did this mean, these restrictions on American banking? What they meant was that American corporations, you know, Pillsbury could make flour in Minnesota and sell it all over the country. General Motors could make cars in Detroit and sell them all over the country. But the big banks couldn't do that. And I think American corporations, especially some of the ones that went overseas, were saying, you know, <clears throat> we're going to have to deal with Deutsche Bank because these American banks can't, you know, do all the things that Deutsche Bank can do for us. And so that little bit of that international story might have come in to explain why we uh, uh, got the banking system we did. Uh, uh, and I will stop with that and turn it over to Alex, and I have to pass him the baton. Thanks, sir. Our, ne race here. Our, next, Run fast, our next discussion, discussion is Alex J. Pollock, a distinguished senior fellow at the R Street Institute. Formerly, he was my colleague here at AEI from 2004 to 2015. And before that, uh, he was the president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago from 1991 to 2004. Uh, Alex works on a lot of financial issues. Uh, uh, business cycles, risk and uncertainty, housing finance, banking systems, and the interaction of all of these things with politics. He's the author of several books and numerous congressional testimonies, shorter articles and opinion pieces. I'm sure you've run across pieces by him in various financial publications. He's a graduate of Williams College, the University of Chicago in Princeton, and Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paul, and, and delightful to be here. As somebody who has spent five decades either working in or thinking about the banking trade, uh, and although I'm not a fan of the Dodd-Frank Act, and like Jeb Henslerling, I am a fan of markets, I really enjoyed reading this book. Uh, it, it, it makes one consider the banking trends over long periods of time, which uh, are quite intriguing, I think. The hotly debated issues of past days which we can now hardly remember uh, how hotly they were debated, uh, and presents a lot of colorful personalities, uh, all of which largely overlapped with my own career. From the very beginning of my own uh, days as an international department trainee in the great international expansion of the uh, American banks, uh, Dick, uh, I've always found the banking system intellectually interesting. And one of the most interesting things about it is the, indeed the constant interaction with governments uh, and between governments and banks, and therefore between banks and politics, exactly what Mark uh, writes about, I think, in, in quite an interesting way. As this is going on, governments try to use banks for their purposes, for the government's purposes, and banks simultaneously try to use government, governments for their purposes, and both succeed uh, 
to some extent, uh, although both find themselves linked together from time to time uh, in financial busts, crises, uh, and bailouts. Uh, in other words, banking is always political finance. The book uses the term political economy. I think of it as political finance. Uh, as one British observer has correctly written, uh, the government's involvement in banking is so immense that it's difficult to see clearly where the private sector world begins and the imprint of the state's authority ends. Market Rules, our book, demonstrates the truth of this observation uh, in the U.S. since the 1960s. But I believe the observation is also true, and Dick mentioned an international perspective. I think this is also true in all times, going back at least to the creation of the Bank of England in 1694, as a mutually profitable deal between King William's government, which had wars to fight and to finance, uh, and the enterprising bankers of the day who propped up the idea of the Bank of England. Uh, in general, um, as banking scholar Charlie Calamaris tells us, every banking system at any time and everywhere is the product of a deal between the politicians and the bankers, which Charlie calls the game of bank bargains. And Market Rules shows us this game in action uh, going on and on uh, in this country since the 1960s. Uh, and just imagine that, in fact, the game is going on all around the world in all different countries uh, at the same time. Now, as, uh, as Dick pointed out in his comments, in the decade before the book's history begins, uh, the U.S. government and bank bargain created a banking system designed purposely to suppress competition uh, and protect existing uh, banks from competition from each other and from other financial companies. Uh, as Arthur Burns, writing in 1988, explained about the 1950s regime, quote, the legislation suppressed competition not only among banks but also between banks and other financial institutions, unquote. And this was in, uh, in numerous uh, ways, including, as Burns wrote, banks could offer interest on time and savings deposits, but the amount they could pay was limited by a regulation known as Reg Q. Market Rules tells us a lot about the debates over Reg Q, which meant the government fixing prices on deposits. In its day, this regulation generated views, the book tells us, which were passionate, uh, and the regulation was considered vital by its supporters, passionate and vital. Now, I thought of having a quiz for the audience about who knew what Regulation Q was, but I decided, <laughs> Bert, you're proving my point. I decided the vote would break down with 100% accuracy by age of the audience. Uh, How old do you have to be? To <laughs> <laughs> Fairly old. Uh, in short, uh, as the book story begins, uh, and in Burns' words, the gov uh, uh, and as, as Burns uh, told us, the government had restricted competitive entry and limited price and product competition, and the design, as Dick said, uh, was to promote safety by effectively having a banking cartel run by the government as cartel manager. Uh, this made the banking system safe but sluggish. The banks of the 1950s, interestingly enough, owned more treasury bonds than they had total loans. Uh, those of us in the trade today find, find that hard to imagine, but so it was. Now, the dismantling of this old-style, simpler cartel and its replacement with a government banking system structure significantly more complex and quite a bit different is the story uh, of, of the book. Uh, over the decades, as market rules relates, uh, there were notable personalities involved. A few examples are worth mentioning. Uh, in the 1960s, there was then controller of the currency, James Saxon, a crusader for more competition. He appeals to me a lot as a character in the story. In the 1970s and 80s, there was Walter Riston, uh, 
uh, the most innovative banker of his day, who renamed the uh, pompous-sounding First National City Bank of New York uh, as Citibank for better marketing. Uh, Riston also led the charge into the sovereign debt disaster of the 1980s. Also in the book is Hugh McCall. Uh, Mark mentioned him in the 1980s and 90s, for whom the National Bank of North Carolina became Nation's Bank, and after that became the Bank of America, as it is now. Uh, and McCall made Charlotte, North Carolina, a banking center on a national basis. Now, that's something that would have seemed highly unlikely when I was a trainee in the bank. In the 1990s and 2000s, for a character, I choose uh, Robert Rubin, who was co-chairman of Goldman Sachs, the Secretary of Treasury of the United States, and then a top-level executive at Citibank, as it faltered and would, had it been left on its own, uh, have crashed. However, largely missing from this last period, and what I think is a uh, key part of the story, are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It would have been a stronger story to include the hyper-political and huge financial role of these two so-called government-sponsored enterprises. Uh, not only their role, but their size. Since Dick uh, wants us to think about numbers, mm -hmm. uh, Fannie is bigger than J.P. Morgan Chase, the biggest bank in the U.S., and uh, Freddie is bigger than Citigroup. Now I want to conclude with just a few slides. All right, Dick wanted numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. You're an economist. Mm -hmm. I'm a financial type, so here's a slide. This lets us <laughs> see the number of, this is commercial banks only uh, from 1950s to now. We see the, the line goes sideways until the 1980s and you then know, that's drops. That's a slide in more ways than one. It looks yeah, like yeah, that is a slide. Down, <laughs> the slide. <laughs> down to the 4,700. Now, I don't think there's much doubt that the shape of this line will continue on down. Um, to the southeast here, and these numbers will fall. But I, I will say, now that's a 65% reduction in the number of banks, uh, but, but uh, 4,700 is still a lot of banks and a lot on an international basis. Um, over this period, while this was going, something, uh, going on, something else also really important happened, which is that the banks became much more concentrated in real estate and real estate risk. Now, real estate is itself a highly political sector, and as, uh, as banking gets more and more focused on real estate, it becomes even more uh, political for the political in, finan in uh, political finance. So we can say that uh, the commercial banks, by and large, can now, today, uh, more correctly be called real estate banks, uh, and that's a huge and important story. Uh, in and of itself. Oops. All right, now uh, we talked about how the, the 1950s uh, was safe but stodgy. There were only 28 banking failures in the whole decade. This is a little history of the number of banking failures in the United States by decade. I think it's a pretty interesting story, actually. And what you see is a huge acceleration in riskiness up into the 70s right in the period that the book is, is discussing, on into the 80s. Everybody probably remembers that a 1,000 or so savings and loans failed in the 1980s, but on top of that, a 1,000, more than a 1,000 commercial banks also failed. It was an utterly disastrous decade uh, for, for the banks, and we saw that same decade is where the reduction in number of banks begins. Failures relative to the old days of 1950s have stayed quite high in succeeding uh, decades. Now, here's a question. What's the optimal number of failures? What's the optimal mix of bank risk versus innovation versus uh, the growth we want out of risk-taking? answer to that question is nobody knows. Uh, and so the banking bargains go on. Uh, these are my last slides here. Uh, the Congress, all during this period, a little bit before the book and then during the period of the book, has been busily legislating away, proving 
that banking and politics is always very active. So uh, here's the banking legislation of the 1950s and 70s. Paul mentioned the Bank, uh, bank Holding Company Act of 1956. There it is, along with a lot of others. There's the Interest Rate Adjustment Act of 1966, where the Congress itself got into price fixing of deposits. Uh, and now here's the decade of the 70s, uh, a lot of legislation. And here's the decade of the 80s, another bunch of legislation. I'll just quickly point out here the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation Improvement Act of 1991 in the middle of this, which proclaimed that it would, by instituting prompt corrective action, <coughs> end bank failures and bank crises. There wouldn't be any more. Well, it was maybe a good theory, but it didn't work. <laughs> Here's banking legislation in the, in the 2000s, a lot of emergency uh, legislation, uh, including some things we have, uh, we have mentioned. And more recently, in the last decade, here's more banking um, legislation. So um, I think this list, just quickly looking through it, underlines this theme which pops so clearly out of the book, that there is constant banking, politics, interaction, deal-making, trying to use both sides of the deal for for uh, the advantage of both sides, and, and if, if it looks mutually advantageous, you can make a deal. And uh, consistent with market rules, looking at this list of acts, just imagine the aggregate amount of lobbying and speechifying <laughs> and... Campaign fundraising. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Campaign fundraising. Good place to be for fundraising, the banking committees, uh, and deal making that went into creating the list we've just uh, reviewed. And thanks, Mark, for getting us to think about all these interesting things. Thanks to both of you for some, some really penetrating and valuable comments. I appreciate it. Uh, now, now, as uh, the moderator, it's my turn. <laughs> so thank you all very much for your, your commentary. So. When I read the book, and uh, I read it all before the snowstorm, so it's, it's a little in the spider webs a little bit, but my recollection is, I mean, and you mentioned tonight, I mean, these presidents since, since Kennedy, since the Kennedy years, uh, were under the impression that unleashing, modernizing the banking system was a ticket for growth without, without taxation, without anything else, that unleashing the powers of the banking system would produce prosperity. And, and, and you detail it all the way through, and it wasn't just Republicans who thought that, it was Democrats who thought that, it was bankers who played that game and went along with it. But there's this, also this overriding uh, sense in your book that you know, markets, you know, this, this, this notion that markets are what create prosperity is kind of oversold. That, you know, is that not, maybe that's not really the case, and maybe we shouldn't believe that so much. So do you believe these presidents were wrong? Or do you believe that, um, I, that's missing in the book. So were they, were, were they successful? I mean, they were successful in creating supermarkets. They were supermarket, successful, absolutely. In creating supermarkets, and, it, and did it, did it get, gain them, the, some, <coughs> at least some, in some measure, the growth that, that they thought would, would be unleashed? I don't know, don't because... Know. As Dick points out, I'm not able to run that series of numbers. What I tried to do was argue that these presidents from Kennedy right through President Trump sought to organize banking in a way to foster prosperity. And I think you make the case well. I think the part that you come away with a, a little bit lacking in the end is what do, what do we think about that? Did it work or not work? I mean, we have the financial crisis in the end, and Dodd-Frank, somebody's trying to overturn Dodd-Frank, mm -hmm. Jeb Hensarling at length, who, uh, what was, the, is the cr financial crisis, does that demonstrate that it, that it ended badly? It doesn't, it doesn't it seem doesn't, that way. It, that it, way, it does not demonstrate say, that it ended badly, that's right. And, and the, the, the origins of the banking crisis are so 
complex. It's not Gramblish Blali, as I tried to point out. Mm -hmm. It resided all the way back in the underestimation of the risks inherent in subprime banking, the fractured regulatory system. Uh, so to, to just to come back to some of the things the, the commentators were saying, if you think about Bank of America and, say, one of the large banks in Chicago, there would be two separate groups of Federal Reserve regulators, in the largest ones, sitting in the bank, but they wouldn't necessarily have to communicate with one another. Similarly, there were different members of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, but they wouldn't have to interact with one another. So you have a fractured regulatory system, an underestimation of the risks inherent in subprime banking, then the repo system. Let's, let's not, we, we don't have enough time, but I, okay. I, I, share, I share, I could tell you a story about the, uh, the J.P. Morgan whale case of the fracture, and, and maybe I will at the end. But So we come back to it. So the, Dick, I, I, you, you've, you have a whole history of economic growth and, and banking and financial sector innovation. So, I mean, do you have any, any sense? I mean, to, to me, I mean, the, I, to me, it was market forces that were pushing the banking system to consolidate, and it was political forces that were keeping that from happening. And all the legislation along the way is, is a grand bargain for uh, different coalitions to get the most, you know, or control, control their condition along the way. So the, to me, the market forces are, are pushing where we ended up, and, and the politics is, is making it happen in, so very in slowly, steps. Very in steps slowly. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the big question of, you know, did, did it really work? Was that a prosperous period for the country? I mean, I, I think the answer is obviously yes. I mean, if you just look, look at the, you know, whether banking caused it or not, I, I would, you know, I, I sort of say we're talking about commercial banks and savings banks here, but you have to look at the whole financial system. Uh, but the, the period, you know, I was privileged to live in, you know, I was born in 1940, and those six decades, the last six decades of the 20th century were about as, if you look at the growth of per capita income, it's about as good as it gets. I mean, you look over 230 or 40 years of American history, those six decades were the best in American history. Things haven't been so great since the year 2000. But, you know, up to then, it was really a very prosperous period. We all remember parts of it, problem. But, you know, the story is that after World War II, the United States didn't have a lot of competition because most of our, whether you were our ally or our enemy, you were pretty much smashed up. And it took a couple of decades for the rest of the world to get back on its feet after World War II. So our businesses had, you know, what everybody else wanted in that period. Our banking system was cartelized. But starting in the, the legislation, you know, the bankers, the commercial bankers gradually got free. But, you know, one of their problems was that Wall Street was, uh, you know, cutting into their market share in finance. And so we didn't talk much about this and you don't talk much about it. But it's an amazing thing. You should compare the balance sheets of, say, Goldman Sachs or most of these other Wall Street firms back in the 1970s with what they are today. You know, they were small partnerships and they all became corporations and expanded their balance sheets greatly. So that's a part of the story here, too, that you have to look at the whole banking system, not just uh, the whole financial system, not just commercial banking. But I think, you know, it, it, I think you're right, Paul, that the, the bankers wanted these, you know, freedoms to do more, and the political system was very slow to catch up with that. And commercial banks in particular were overregulated, so that's why Wall Street took away a lot of their market share. And of course, that gave, gave the bankers a case for saying, look, look what's happening to us. You know, Wall Street is uh, taking over. Uh, another, another point, um, and then we'll turn to the audience maybe for questions. Uh, during the 1980s and into the 1990s, um, there was kind of a, in my recollection, working at the Federal Reserve uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a sub-competition going on between Federal Reserve holding companies and OCC banks. And uh, while Glass-Steagall was still in effect, there was something called a Section 20 part of the Glass-Steagall Act that allowed banks to do some, some underwriting of securities and investment business, and that 
under Greenspan, he allowed that to expand quite a lot. So by point of fact, by the mid-90s, we really had investment banking and banking mixed in bank holding companies. The national banks wanted a piece of that, and I think you might have you covered that a little bit. But the, the laws were forced, essentially, at some point to, to catch up with that. They, they, at, at some level, the Federal Reserve through the back door was pushing a liberalization that finally got cauterized in the, in the Graham Leach Bliley in 1999. And I, I'm, I'm not sure that, did you, I'm not sure I picked up on that totally, but. I thought I covered that. Did, did you? Not okay. as articulately as, as you just did, <laughs> uh, especially your, you, you have superior knowledge of section 20. But I disagree with some of what, what you're saying here about uh, banks catching up, uh, laws catching up with markets. The, the ability to discern the market's sovereign judgment is very difficult. And bankers disagreed right through early 1999 about Graham Leach Bliley, especially the smaller bankers. They did, they did fight And the, the insurance details. companies, and in, before that, the securities dealers. That, that's covered well. Um, but the, the forces to reunite, to, to reunite investment banking and commercial banking w were taking place from the late 80s Absolutely. all the way up to, to the, and, and that was happening without legislation and it was, in a sense, pushing politicians kind of to the inevitable it, it that they had to through, deal with. It, it took place by, uh, through regulators, that's yeah, right. Regulators are, and it comes across in many points in your book, that, regu that unelected regulators <laughs> behind the scenes, That's right. just like today, are so yeah. important in interpreting the laws on the books and, and allowing financial innovation uh, before the Congress gets to issues that it may, may or may not address. Not just allowing, encouraging and directing. Absolutely. So with that, why don't we turn it over to the audience and take some Q&A. So why don't I start here and then go to Bert, right here in front. Please, please tell us your name and then ask your question and keep it short if you could. Okay. Uh, my name is Mark Tunney with Mathematical Finance Company and I work with the American Academy of Actuaries Committee that does risk calibration for their risk model. Um, and this group has started a project to get the calibration data for bank and insurance and derivative dealers risk models made public on a regular basis, like monthly, not just in the U.S. and other countries. And Christine Lagarde, the head of the IMF, supports the project. And we've talked to Brian Moyer, the director of Bureau of Economic Analysis. Um, my impression is we're going to have the most trouble getting the banks to cooperate. So what's your question? Well, you've talked about the politics of this. Well, what, what do you think of the politics of getting the calibration data for bank and insurance and derivative dealer risk models made public? Sounds like a great idea. Mm -hmm. But who's going who's gonna to resist it, and how, how do I get this to happen? It sounds like a hard project to me, politically. Uh, one of my favorite lines in the book is how uh, all of the banks and the savings banks thought the most horrifying prospect uh, as, the, as the 1990s went along was that an insurance company might own a savings and loan, and that would really be awful. And as I read it, I imagine my nice account I have with State Farm Bank, which actually used State Farm as the, mm -hmm. if State Farm insurance company owned a savings and loan, uh, wouldn't that be really horrible? And uh, there is now State right Farm Bank, and it's, <laughs> it's not so horrible. They, they treat my account pretty well. So I think the, the, uh, the uh, industry politics of what you're talking about sound hard to me. So I wish you good luck. Okay. Bert. Thank you, Thank you uh, Bert Ely, a banking consultant. Uh, just a, a, a quick observation and a question. Um, I haven't heard any discussion about the impact of electronic technology on how it's affected the, the banking industry. Does the book uh, get into that? Uh, it would seem to me that that uh, would be a, a significant uh, factor. But here's, here's my question. Um, okay, we've seen this evolution of banking over the last uh, umpteen, you know, several decades. Uh, we are where we are today. Uh, what do you do about it? It's, 
are there is there a need for fixes? Are there is there a need for significant uh, change in in the legislation or the regulation of, of banks? How is all this supposed to go evolve from where we are today? So you have two great questions. Yes, I talk about computers in the sense of, for example, Walter Riston uh, purchased computers and then leased them to companies who, who needed some computer space. So the question was, did that constitute a legally made loan for a regulated commercial bank? So that fell within the purview of regulation and, and, and legislation. Ultimately, it was answered, yes, that they can do that. I, I don't have an answer about what we need in the future. As, as these gentlemen were pointing out, we have a heck of a lot of bank legislation out there. And, every, it's, and it, I, the phrase I use in the book is the endlessness of it all. It never stops. So, Bert, the answer is, as long as we have banks and politicians, we'll have more legislation. <laughs> well said. Well, as long as they're all run by human beings, Bert, there'll, there'll be more politics and more legislation. But the key is, will, on average, uh, economic growth continue? And that will, it will continue if, on average, there is more innovation, there is risk-taking. Uh, there is competition, and there is the rule of law. But at the same time, that's on average, and every now and then, since these are all the government agencies, the banks themselves, uh, not to mention all the rest of society, are composed of human beings with all their foibles, uh, their hypocrisy, their fears, their self-delusion, as well as their good ideas and their drive and their energy. From time to time, we're going to have uh, crashes and, and mess ups. Uh, but the question is, on average, do we keep going up? And my, my answer to that is yes. I, I think, if I could weigh in on Bert's question, that you, you know, the technology is subject to economies of scale. So the bigger banks can you know, uh, afford the technology more and, and probably benefit more from it. And, and that's going to continue. Uh, so I think it's an important point you're raising. Uh, and to me, it suggests that what the future is for, you know, even though we've seen the banks fall from, what did I say, 30,000 98 years ago to 5,000 now, it's, we're probably going to have even smaller numbers. I mean, the trend is for that number to get smaller. Uh, that doesn't mean, you know, I think what's going on now, I mean, I used to think, well, yeah, you, the number of banks is going down, but the number of branches is, is uh, going up. But today, I think the number of branches is actually going down as well. And that's because, you know, I, I mean, I, I paid a few bills this morning before I got on the plane to come down here from snowy New Hampshire. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't have to go to the bank. Your the, iPhone, your iPhone you, the is bankers will tell you your yeah, phone that's right. is the next is the I mean, next we all, we all have a supercomputer in our pocket now that can yeah. do all kinds of things for us. Bert, if you just push on uh, the electronic idea, we'll all uh, know. Uh, one of the questions is, how far can artificial intelligence go? So I would like to propose that suppose that there really is true intelligence uh, embedded in, in electronic machines. Will that intelligence do better uh, at avoiding mistakes and politics and, and uh, periodic busts and crashes than natural human intelligence, and my answer is no, it will not. That it's it's inherent to the it's inherent uh, to the problem of intelligence, which is the unknowability of the future, and and what we're struggling through is dealing with that uncertainty and unknowability, whether it's machines or or, or people, and also because of that, we're going to keep having political attempts to make the uncertain more certain, but they will never succeed. And therefore, as Mark says, this game will go on forever. Take a question. How about back there first, and we'll come up here again. Oh, uh, Mike Webb. Uh, I was graduating from college around the growth of uh, super regionals and ATMs popping up and all that kind of thing. But I was at a, a, a conference last week. They were talking about startups and things like that. Uh, in terms of technology startups, they seem to be popping up in the same places where the super regionals 
suddenly sprung up, Charlotte, uh, Atlanta, Nashville. And I'm wondering, is there anything outside of the banking finance community that causes that kind of thing to happen? That there, it's the same places where these things are popping up. You mean community banking arising right next to the... No, I think he means fintechs. Oh, uh, he, he means fintech. 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 Oh, fintech. Yeah. I, I'm not... A, I've written a little bit about fintech. It's my impression that, you know, some people say fintech is a big competitive challenge to banking. My guess is the banks themselves, the established banks, especially the bigger ones, will, you know... They're already doing it, I think, but they're going to, you know, incorporate fintech into their models, and they probably. Uh, so I, I don't view fintech as so much a challenge to the current structure of banks, but you know, the big banks will, as a part of the technological revolution, will will incorporate fintech into their models. It's an interesting question. I decided not to take up fintech. I was becoming aware of their development as I was completing the book, and. I, I didn't want to push on into a new area. But it shouldn't be surprising to any of us that the cities in which these firms are appearing are the larger, more prosperous cities that are drawing in recent college graduates, people with MA degrees, uh, major universities. Up here, please. Uh, Gerald Chandler, it seems to me that you uh, were talking about banks and that you did not include savings and loans and credit unions and even ATMs. Mm -hmm. So when we have this chart of what happened to banks, it would have been more interesting or more inclusive to me to say what was the total of banks, savings and loans, credit unions, and so on. And the so answer the is question 19, is, the question is, am I right that you didn't include them? Yeah, they weren't in our numbers, but we can, I can tell you what the numbers are. In 1950, the sum of savings and loans and banks was something over 19,000 institutions. That's, that sum is now down to about 5,400 or so. So there is, it, the, the decline is even steeper uh, if you include the savings banks. The fundamental question underlying the book is, around 1960 there were savings and loans, investment banks, commercial banks, small insurance brokerage outfits. And by the late 1990s, there were these what I called supermarket banks. And so the question was, how did that transformation take place? But no, I did not specify the number of savings and loans, and perhaps I should have. And credit unions. I'm credit, sorry? Yeah. And credit yeah. unions, yeah. right. I, I think we had some question. savings and loans in some of our numbers, but not credit unions. Right. Similar credit unions, similar reduction. There were all very large number of credit unions. All the U.S you add it all together, with half the population of today had, I don't know, six or eight times as many financial uh, institutions. So th that we see, if you think about it on a per capita basis, a huge shrinkage. But in sum, they're all bigger. The, the, the sum, sum total of banking assets relative to GDP, to the size of the economy, is bigger than it was, even though the number of institutions is smaller. Thank you. I'll take advantage of the remarkable historical perspective that you all have and let any of you who want to answer this question take it. Doctor Who, the British TV character who brought the time-traveling machine, the TARDIS, to the use of mankind has made it available to you. And, and you can go back, each of you can go back to 2002 uh, with an appointment as the Federal Reserve Chairman and you're, you're really respected so you've got cred. What's the one thing you would do to prevent the 2008 Great Recession? <laughs> <laughs> well, that assumes the Federal Reserve can do that. One of the major yeah. mistakes I think they made early on was in not recognizing um, special purpose entities that they allowed to go off balance sheet. Uh, they, the regulators uh, debated the regulatory treatment of these, the capital treatment of these, and they never settled it, and they kind of forgot about it. And all those assets that were highly risky and finally blew up, many of them ended up situated in special purpose entities, uh, which there were hundreds of them. Many banks had them. Nobody was looking at what was in them. They should have been. Um, I think that was one of the single biggest mistakes because nobody saw 
the problems that we're building or worried about it. And it wasn't like we didn't see it earlier. Back in the late 1999, around 1999, in the finance company industry, uh, a number of finance companies had issued, made a lot of loans on what they call um, manufactured housing, which is a fancy name for mobile homes. There's a particular outfit, Conseco, and a few other ones. And they packaged, the way they funded themselves was they packaged up their mobile home loans into uh, structured, structured bonds, uh, senior, and, and, and sold them off to the market. And uh, when that bubble blew up, it blew up because at the time in 1999, they had nobody to sell the equity loss piece, the riskiest piece to anybody, because nobody believed the accounting and there was nobody. So they kept it on balance sheet and they valued them very highly. And an auditor went in and, and, and basically brought them, brought them to truth and had to write down their equity piece. And they were bankrupt and they blew up and that whole market fell apart. But it wasn't part of the banking system and regulators didn't learn anything from it. Uh, subsequently, a few years later, Enron had some of the same problems with off-balance sheet uh, repos, repo, uh, what would they call them, repo 360, where they re did repurchase agreements that were just under the, the wire, so they had all kinds of uh, fancy ways to, to, to raise really hot money, really risky, without anybody really knowing it. Um, Enron blew up. But the banking, it wasn't in the banking system. So the banking, the banking regulators never learned their lesson from that. And those things ended up biting them and causing the financial crisis. Great, great point. And subprime auto, subprime exactly, auto. The, exactly yeah. the same story in the same way. But I, my answer would be different. Uh, don't drop interest rates if you're the Fed in those uh, 2002, three, four, in order to create a housing boom to offset the mild Certainly depression, compounded it. that made it worse. And the other thing, I, I would say Paul is absolutely right in what he says, but you could state it more generally, which is look for high leverage based on exaggerated prices of assets. Mm -hmm. that's, the sa that's what's the same about all those cases, and it was the same about housing. So if you'd only been smart enough, which nobody, well, hardly anybody was, uh, you'd have tried to see what happens to highly leveraged structures if the prices of the underlying assets drop dramatically. Can I put, make and, a comment on that? I mean, of I course think you can. One of the uh, points that Alex made was that banking has become like real estate banking now. Uh, you know, like what half of half of the lending is on half of know, all the loans. Half of all loans are commercial or residential real estate loans. Now, uh, that's to me that's and that wasn't true, you know, especially in commercial banking fifty or sixty years ago. Uh, but one of the things you learn when you study banking history, and I think Walter Badgett said it. You know, Badgett's rules, the English uh, editor of the Economist, who wrote, uh, you know, the banks should uh, be lenders of last resort, and so on. You know, he said, if you want to be a banker, you need to know one important thing, the difference between a promissory note and a mortgage. Your business deals with the former. And so bad, you know, classical banking theory says that you know, commercial banks should not be involved in real estate. Alex Pollack says you know, they're heavily involved in real estate now. Uh, and you know, in colonial America, they had land banks, and you know, we rejected the idea because the land banks had, had the same trouble. We, what happens when the property values fall? We got into trouble in 2002 or three that you were talking about because on Wall Street, and the guys that were taking all these mortgages and package, packaging them into uh, mortgage-backed securities said, well, you know, we're perfectly safe now because real estate prices never go down. And so, you know, if we lend money to this guy who just swam the Rio Grande from Mexico and he gets to buy a $400,000 house in America, there's no risk there because if he doesn't pay his mortgage, we'll just, you know, take over the house. I mean, yeah. that's the kind of thinking that was going on. And, you know, anybody who knows any economic or financial history knows that real estate, there have been bubbles for forever in real estate. And so I would say that maybe the, the danger in our system today is that we're too much involved and in, banks are too much involved in real estate. Let me, I think we'll close it in just a second. But one final thought. While we, all my smart panelists and myself may have, with hindsight, perfect 2020 <laughs> hindsight, decided exactly exactly 
how we would have stopped the last financial crisis. You have to remember, if there are no losses, the politics of the day mm. is not going to let the regulator shut it any, anything down. Oh, there was the young lady there who had her hand up okay, throughout the question. <laughs> Could she ask the last question? Of course she can. <laughs> I just wrote a book called Hamilton. I just wrote Nancy Spanis. I just wrote a book called Hamilton versus Wall Street, so you know my outlook. But the uh, what I wanted to raise, I haven't unfortunately read the book, but I know that there was at the time of Dodd Frank coming through, there was also a move from the to reinstate Glass Steagall. There was legislation in the Senate, Maria Cantwell, et cetera. And following that, there was legislation in the House for the next several years that got over 100 supporters. Uh, and the argument that was made was popular like Henserling. This was when Glass-Steagall was there, there was the golden age of productivity in the mm -hmm. United States. The mm -hmm. 30s to the 50 period, which you referenced, was the period where economists indicate productivity was at its height. Now, I wonder what you, uh, how you would reflect on that. Let, let me pick up two, two questions. We, we only have a second, Mark, so I, you have to be really quick. Oh, here we go. Yes, <laughs> that, that legislation was, was in the House and Senate. It was not backed by the administration. They were interested, as I argue in the book, in promoting and perpetuating the supermarket banks. They were not interested in breaking banks apart and the economic disruption they judged would follow. So uh, that'll have to be the last word. I'm afraid we're out of time. I'd like to thank my guest author, Mark Rose, and the distinguished panelists for their commentary. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>